morning, everybody watching online. Great to have you uh, with us here or uh, online. And uh, yeah, this is not an Ed Sheeran concert. Uh, just to let you know that, um, even though he tries to look like me. Um, we are in our uh, ninth and final week. It's hard to believe it's nine weeks since the start of September. It's all a complete blur to me. But nine weeks um, and our ninth and final week on our What is the Point series. What's the point? And uh, last week, uh, Pastor Brian was here and he shared a great message on what is the point of generosity. If you missed, missed that, uh, you should catch up on it. It's been challenging me um, all week. It's been chasing me all week um, as, I've, as I've just gone about my business. Um, and today we're going, to, we're going to bring our series to a close. And uh, it's no uh, mistake that uh, today, as we have a worship night on tonight uh, at 7.30, that uh, it's no mistake that we're going to close this series by looking at what is the point of worship? What is the point of worship? Um, you'll know that, that this week was half term week, so um, I had planned to uh, have a kids are off school, take some time, have a few days with them. And uh, so for once in my life, I was actually quite organized. And 10 days, two weeks ago, I had about 80% of a message written. thought, ah, Yes, I get a few days off. I sat down on Thursday, just thought for a couple of hours, put the finishing touches to it, and it'll be ready to go. And I had to throw the whole thing in the bin and start again because the Lord took me in a totally different direction. Um, so I want to share with you uh, where he took me to on Thursday. Uh, and it's this. Worship is the attitude of abandonment. Worship is the attitude of abandonment. Let's pray. Lord, we um, thank you for your presence here already this morning, God. Thank you that, um, Lord, you want to be here. Uh, Lord, we don't need to force you or convince you, but that you're here uh, and that you want to meet with your people today, God. And I pray, um, Lord, that whether we're, we're sitting in this room or whether we're watching online, that, that we wouldn't... Uh, Leave this service today, Lord, the same way as when we walked in. Lord, I pray that your, your spirit would speak, would transform, would heal, would set free, and would save, um, Lord, that your kingdom would come in us today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're going to start our journey off uh, today in Psalm 40. Psalm Number 40, a familiar-ish psalm maybe to you. Um, in fact, you too wrote a song on it. Well, it could be 30 years ago now they wrote that, called 40, which was based on this psalm. And it's David writing, and he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of the horrible pit out of the Mary clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. There is a description of our testimony right there. He lifted us out of a muddy pit and set our feet upon a rock. Verse three, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. But I stumbled into on Thursday, that verse number three, but in the message version of the Bible. And this is what it says. He taught me how to sing the latest God song, a praise song to our God. More and more people are seeing this. They enter the mystery. Here it is. Abandoning themselves abandoning themselves to God. Here's the whole premise. Here's the whole point of this message. True worship is abandonment to God. True worship is fully trusting God. You see, if we make worship about the type of song that we sing, or how we express it, we'll just have an argument about which expression is better than the other. It's too loud. It's too quiet. I don't like that Bethel lot. I like the old ones. 
we sing far too many of those old songs. It's too bright. It's too dark. It's too long. It's too short. There are as many opinions in this room about how we express worship as there are people. And you all know the saying about opinions. They're like armpits. Everybody has them. Some of them stink. But true worship is about none of these things. True worship is about abandonment and surrender to God. You see, we can come every Sunday, sing a few songs, might even come tonight to the worship night, sing a few songs, maybe even raise the hands. If we're really adventurous, break into a wee Pentecostal two-step. We can do all of these things, but not actually abandon ourselves to God. In other words, we come in, in control, and we leave in control. We can do the same with our quiet time. We can, we can come to our quiet time and be in control and finish it in control with the Bible reading and prayer boxes ticked. What I mean by in control is areas of our lives where I'm still on the throne and he's not. To put it theologically, areas of my life that are not under his lordship. We've got to get this. We have not worshipped if we don't abandon control of our lives to God. Paul wrote this in, in Romans 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, he says, I, I plead with you. I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Abandon yourself to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. In other words, let them be surrendered to God. The kind of sacrifice that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. That is worship. Now, there's, there's two ways to think about this word abandon. And so we'll turn to my second favorite book, the dictionary, and uh, look at the two definitions that you can find of this word abandon. The first one is this. Uh, abandon means to give up with the intent of never again claiming a right or interest in. So your, your, your boat's sinking, you shout, abandon ship, okay? Forget about it, give it up. Sometimes property is abandoned and just forgotten about and goes derelict. It's not really the definition that we're looking for today. Here's the second definition that you'll find in the dictionary. It says to give up to the control or influence of another person or agent. To give up to the control of another person. It's not, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about abandonment. It's not a just, oh, do you know what, forget about it, whatever. Abandon ship, just leave it, let it go there. Like, no, no, we're talking about an active, proactive, continual giving up of control to God. Because there is a constant battle within us. There is a constant temptation for us to try and take things into our own hands. To take control. To do it my way. I think somebody sang a song about that, actually. Um, to make things happen. And actually, the, the strange thing is with us is that one of the most <laughs> prominent times that we can do this is actually when God has promised something. We try and make it happen when we want it to happen and how we want it to happen. Even the great hero of the faith, Abraham, did this. God had promised Abraham a son. He pro God promised him that, that him, and, him and his wife Sarah would have a son. But Abraham got a little impatient. It wasn't happening in the time frame that Abraham thought it should happen in. So he started to manipulate and to control the outworking and the timing of this promise from God. 
and ended up having a child called Ishmael with another lady called Hagar who wasn't his wife. Now, years later, God honoured, God still honoured his promise. And, and Abraham and Sarah had a son called Isaac. But Abraham's striving, Abraham's taking matters into his own hands caused a whole mess, a whole strife, a whole division in his house and actually started a generational conflict which still goes on today, nearly 4,000 years later. There's consequences when we take things into our own hands. But for all of us, there's, a, there's this struggle to let go of control. We have, we, see, we have this need to be doing something to make things happen. But sometimes we need the faith to wait. Faith to take our hands off the wheel and abandon control to God. Sometimes faith is doing nothing. Just like Jesus refused to turn stone into bread when he hadn't eaten for 40 days. It took more faith to do nothing than to do the miracle. You see, we can listen to worship all day long, sing at the top of our lungs in the car, and then have that awkward moment at the traffic lights when you realize the person beside you has been watching. Hi, how you doing? We can lift our hands on a Sunday and still be trying to control our own lives. But we haven't worshipped unless we've abandoned ourselves to God. This is actually where true peace and true joy come from. When we give up control, when we surrender to, to God's control, we are actually free. You see, just so many things in the kingdom of God work in the complete opposite way to the way we think, the complete opposite way to how culture operates. We think, when I've got control, when, I've the bo when I'm the boss, then I'll finally be free. Not in God's kingdom. The more we surrender control to him, the more freedom that we will experience. Worry, fear, anxiety, depression, sadness. So often, not all of the time, but so often, these are fruit of us trying to hold on to control, trying to control things that really we can't control. God has a peace for us that passes understanding, but we've got to let go. We've got to abandon ourselves to his control. So the question is then, why don't we? Why, why do we not do this? Why do we not abandon ourselves to God? Why do we keep trying to wrestle back control from him? Well, actually, I want to tackle that question by coming at it from the other direction. How can we trust God more? How can we abandon ourselves to him more? There's this little verse in uh, Psalm 103 that says that God revealed his character to Moses, but he revealed his deeds to the people of Israel. He revealed his character to Moses, but his deeds to the people of Israel. If we're going to abandon ourselves to God, if we're going to trust God more, if we're going to surrender to God, we need to get past looking at his deeds and begin to look at his character and appreciate his character. So today, I want to share with you in the time that we have left on the four omnis. Now, that sounds weird, but it'll make sense in a minute, I promise. Okay? The four omnis, O-M-N-I, of God. And when we grasp these things, they're going to help us in this abandonment, this letting go, this giving up control to him. Here's the first one, and hopefully they'll begin to come, become familiar here. God is omnipotent. Number one, he is omnipotent. Omni, potent. Okay, this is a, these are Latin words. Omni means all and potent means power. He is all powerful. 
God, God just, doesn't have, just doesn't have some power. He doesn't just have a lot of power. He has all power. He is supreme. First Chronicles 29 expresses it like this. It says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord. And this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. And at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. A bit later on in Abraham's life, when he'd kind of learned his lesson about doing things God's way, God comes along and asks him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. The son of the promise. God asks Abraham to sacrifice what he has been believing his whole life for. His promise his blessing, his future, his legacy is all tied up in Isaac. And God asks him to sacrifice. And I love how you can see in this story, it's in Genesis 22, how, how Abraham has matured, I suppose for want of a better word, and that it says, God asked him to do this, and then it says, the next morning, Abraham got up. He knew God has asked me to do this and I'm going to do it. And Abraham takes Isaac and then they, 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 go, they travel for three days. And then just in verse 5, we want, I want to pause and read this verse of Genesis 22, verse 5. Abraham says to the, the, the young men that were with him, he says, stay here with the donkey and the lad and I, Isaac and I, will go yonder and abandon ourselves and worship. Look at this. And we will come back to you. We will come back to you. Abraham is prepared to be abandoned in worship. He is prepared to abandon his future, his hope, his promise, his blessing. The writer of Hebrews helps us understand this. In chapter 11, in verse 17, when, when he, they write, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Look at this, verse 19. Concluding. Maybe some of us need to conclude today, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Abraham got to the place where he realized he could give up control because he knew the all-powerful God was able to raise his promise up even from the dead. Maybe today you need to abandon yourself to the power of an all-powerful God. Nothing is impossible for him. No mountain is too high. No sickness is too strong. No situation is too difficult. No person is too far. No demon or devil in hell is too strong for our all-powerful God. Maybe we need to give him a little bit of praise this morning for that. No, no matter what situation you're looking at this morning, in the words of Jesus himself said, this is impossible for man, but with God, finish it for me, all things are possible. God is all powerful. Here's the second one. He is also omniscient. Omniscient, okay? This again comes from the Latin omni meaning all, and actually the other word that it comes from is the word science, which means knowledge. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing, all-knowing. 
Psalm 147, verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. He is all powerful, but also his understanding is infinite. He is all knowing. There is no limit to his wisdom and his understanding. There's a story that happens in 2 Samuel chapter 15 to King David. And his son Absalom has rebelled. He has rebelled against his dad. He set up this um, plot to depose his dad um, from the throne. And he, he basically tries to take over the whole show. And does, actually, take over the whole show. But David doesn't, in this moment, fight it. He doesn't raise an army and quash this rebellion. He just leaves and lets God take care of it. And then uh, we'll pick up the, the story in verse 25 of chapter 15 of 2 Samuel. And uh, the priest, Zadok, is trying to take the ark. David's leaving Jerusalem. He's leaving the capital. And the priest is trying to take the ark with him. So that the, the ark, which was the presence of God, it was where they worshipped. And David said to Zadok, take the ark back into the city. Carry it back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me, it, show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says thus, so if, in other words, if God says, I have no delight in you, David says, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. And then just down the page in verse 32, it says, Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. See, here's what David is saying. God knows more than I do. So I'm going to trust him. I'm going to let him do whatever he wants to do. Abraham worshipped by abandoning himself and trusting in the power of God. And here David worshipped by abandoning himself and trusts that God knows better. That God knows what he's doing. We read Psalm 40 at the very start of this message. And most theologians believe that Psalm 40 was written in this moment. When David was running away from Absalom. I waited patiently for the Lord. I don't know about you, but in a moment like that, the last thing I'd be doing is waiting patiently. I'd be saddling up, calling the boys, squashing this little toe rag that dared take over from me. Maybe that's why the Lord has to remind us in Isaiah 55, when he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. See, we can abandon ourselves to a God who has the power to do the impossible. Who knows way more than we do. And here's number three. He is omnipresent. You don't need a Latin degree to figure that one out. He is omnipresent. He is all present. Just want to read three scriptures for you. Hebrews 13, 5. And these are maybe scriptures that have resonated with you in certain times. And it says, For he himself said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Psalm 46 verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, our ever present help in trouble. Psalm 23 and verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are set with me with me your rod and your staff 
they comfort me. He is all present. He doesn't promise that life will be trouble free. But he does promise that we won't have to go through it alone. But can we be real today? Sometimes it feels like he's absent. Sometimes it feels like he's silent and has left us to it. Sometimes it feels like we're abandoned by God. And as I reflected over the times that I've experienced that, the thought struck me that maybe when I'm in that place, that instead of asking the question, where are you, God? Maybe there's a better question to ask. Maybe there's a question to ask myself. Am I abandoned to him? Or am I still in control? Am I still trying to make things happen my way? And my time? My agenda? And there's a little verse in Psalm 22 that says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And if we make a choice to abandon ourselves to worship him, no matter the valley, no matter the storm, no matter what trouble we are in, we will know the ever-present help of the all-present one. I love these words of comfort in Isaiah. In some ways they're words of comfort and in some ways they're they're a, war, they're a bit of a warning in a sense too because he says when you pass through the waters. He doesn't say, he doesn't say if you pass through the waters. He says when you pass through the waters. What? I will be with you. And through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire. Not if. But when you walk through the fire you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. See, true worship is abandoning ourselves to God. He he is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He can do the impossible. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He's way smarter than we are. He is omnipresent. He is all-present. He is the ever-present help in trouble. But here's our fourth and final one, and the team can join us again on stage. And this is one you maybe haven't heard of before. He is omni-benevolent. Omni-benevolent. And this one isn't in all the theology textbooks. It's in some of them. It's not in all of them. Because there's certain philosophers can't, can't get all these to gel together. They can't think he can be all of this and all of that and all of that. Anyway. But I believe this is fundamentally key if we're going to unlock our abandonment and trust to God. And I'm going to unpack this word for you for what it means. We've got to get this. Again, it's from Latin. Omni, meaning all. Bene, meaning good. Volens, meaning willing. Our God is all good and all Willing. Reminded me of a story in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 8, at the very start of the chapter. It says, Jesus had come down from the mountain. Great multitudes had followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if. It's only two letters, but that's a big word. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You see, for most of us, 
probably all of us actually. This one is either the key that unlocks or the hurdle that blocks our trust, surrender, and abandonment to God. Easily enough, we can believe in His power. It's fairly easy to understand and appreciate that He's way smarter than we are. We can even be aware of and experience His presence. But we can find ourselves in a place where we mistrust His heart, where we mistrust His intentions. We're unconvinced of his goodness. I'm not too sure about his willingness to get involved in our lives. We battle to believe, to accept that God is good and willing to be good. And actually, I think we need to even just in this moment declare that. Even if you're watching at home, say this out loud. God is good and willing to be good to me. You see, we struggle with the doubts that that really are his intentions for for my best. Is he really for me? Because so often we find ourselves in a place that we don't understand. We find ourselves in circumstances that we can't make sense of. And the the only way that I could think to try and even put an analogy on this, and it's it's a weak one at that, but, but my kids don't understand when I won't feed them sweets all day or when I make them sit down and do their homework. Or when I turn the TV off because they've been watching it for too long. Or when I discipline them. But I am for them. My plans for them are for their good, even when they don't realize it. And this, this, is, this is where it is. This is the hub. We've got to get this. Because their definition of good and what I know to be good for them is not the same thing. And it's just like that with me and my father. He sees a picture that I don't see. He has a perspective that I can't grasp. And very often, my definition of what is good and what he knows to be good for me are not the same. I just want to finish by reading two more scriptures. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. It says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He is slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works and James chapter 1 verse 17 it says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation. It's not he loves me one day and doesn't love me the next. There's no variation or shadow of turning. Today he is drawing us to a place of worship. A place of letting go. A place of surrendering. A place of complete abandonment. Abandonment to his power, believing that he is able. Abandonment to his knowledge, knowing that he knows better. Abandonment to his presence, but most of all, abandonment, in other words, full trust 
and his intentions and his willingness and his heart and in his goodness. Let's all just close our eyes and bow our heads for a moment. Abraham and his son climbed a mountain in a place called Moriah. And that son climbed that mountain to be a sacrifice. But God provided an alternative. And almost 2,000 years later, on the very same mountain, another son walked up that hill. Another son whose father had asked him to be a sacrifice. This time there was no alternative because he was the alternative. And Jesus, having been beaten and whipped and mocked and spat on, was hanging on that cross and he said, Father, Why have you abandoned me? And in that moment, God the Father turned his face from his son so that he could turn his face to you and to me. Jesus was abandoned so that we could be accepted. He was abandoned so that we could be loved, so that we could be saved, so that we could be healed, so that we could be forgiven. And if you haven't experienced that love and acceptance of Jesus, and either you're here in the room or you're watching online, and just for a moment I want to give you an opportunity to respond to him today as he reaches out to you in love today so if if you want to respond by making him your saviour today I'm just going to give you a little moment and lift your hand in this room or if you're online you can let the team know that are there online and that's okay maybe you don't want to raise your hand in this room and you're fighting this at the minute but don't leave without speaking to one of our team they'll be over here on my left your right at the end of the service but I think there's a response needed and required from all of us this morning so I encourage you to stand with me this morning as we as we respond to God because I believe his spirit is here And he very kindly and very gently, but very firmly, is putting his finger on some things in our lives, some areas in our lives that are not abandoned to him. Places in our hearts that we're still holding on to control. Places in us that we're still trying to do it our way. Still trying to make things happen in our timing and our strength. And he's calling us to a place of abandonment today. He's drawing a line in the sand and asking us to step over to trust him today. And so if if that's you, and honestly, I'm sure it's all of us (laughs) this morning, I encourage you, just hold out your hands in front of you this morning to respond to him. Nobody's looking. And so, Lord, Lord, we're blown away by your love today, Lord. We're blown away that you would choose 
Jesus, that you would choose to suffer that for us. And so today, Lord, we pray for those areas in our lives that we have not yet released to you, God. I pray that even in this moment now, in this time of worship after this, Lord, that you would that we would abandon those things and those places and those areas to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would abandon to your power, knowing that you are able. Lord, pray that we would abandon to your knowledge, knowing that you know way more than we do. Lord, I pray that we would be abandoned to your presence, even in the valley of the shadow, Lord. But Lord, most of all, I pray today that we would leave this place abandoned to your heart. Lord, fully trusting, fully surrendered, knowing that you are all good and that you are all willing. So we just bless your name today, Lord. We give you glory and give you praise. In Jesus' name.